Welcome to the Tasty Comics panel here at SVX 2015. Uh, I'm Lauren Jordan. I am your head chef, as I was told to call myself. Uh, I am the editor and curator of Food Zine and Comfort Food Zine, two food themed anthologies <laughs> that came out in 2013 and this, earlier this year. Uh, my table number is N12B if you would like to come pick up copies of Comfort Food Zine. And going down, everyone's going to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Robin Ha, and I'm the creator of Bantan in Two Pages. Um, which is coming out next uh, July, so stay tuned. Um, and my recent collaboration was uh, with B Big Planet Comics. They have an anthology out, out called Blue, which is uh, debuting at this SBX. So, and my table number is B5A. Um, hi, I'm Jade. What else was I supposed to say? <laughs> um, uh, um, what, what books have you made oh, that are food okay, related? So I was, I was also in comfort food scene. I did a story about a Chinese hot pot. And I drew a dumpling scene about Chinese dumplings. Um, my most recent work, I'm actually in Chainmail Bikini. It's not a food related comic, but it's around SPX. Um, the latest food thing I'm working on is I'm working on my own a uh, webcomic and illustration blog um, featuring more stories about uh, family recipes, including dumplings and beyond. And I'm also in a um, an erotic food-themed comic <laughs> anthology called Food Porn. Um, it's coming out with filthy figments. Awesome. Nice. Uh, my name is Eric Colossal. I draw a comic called Rutabaga, the Adventure Chef. Um, came out this year. Um, I'm at, oh, do you ta say your table number? Oh, yeah. I'm a floater. I'm a nomad. So I'm, uh, yeah. Don't so pin, I can't pin you down. Yeah, I just. Uh, I'm at table C10, and this is my most recent and only thing that I do is rutabaga. Um, my name is Jesse Zabarski. Um, I'm at table N13. Um, I think the most recent food thing I've done was actually comfort food zine. I've got a comic in there about. Uh, Butter salt rice, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I also do a comic series called Witchlight, and there's a lot of food in it because they gotta eat. Like they're, they're running around doing stuff and fighting things, they gotta eat too. <laughs> all right. So um, clearly, uh, all of us love food because we have chosen to make comics about food. So I was just wondering uh, what you guys like why you feel like it's important to relate to other people about food through comics specifically, and like why you think comics is like such a good media for doing that. Okay. Just starting off big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big subject. Food to me is the most enjoyable thing in my life. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> and, um, you know, as you get older, you have like less and less things you can do with your friends. Like, you know, when you're young, you could play with the doll or whatever and have fun. But I think the choices are getting limited as you become an adult. And food, I think it's gonna continue on no matter what age you are and what state of you know, life you are. And I, you know, when I'm having a good time with my friends and family, I'm always, 99% of the time, I'm eating something with them. So um, I think that's why it's important to me. And comic, I think as a medium, uh, it can draw in people a lot easier than a lot of other artistic medium, in my opinion. I mean, it's very casual. You can just pick it up and read it. You don't have to, like, use too much of your brain power to understand what's going on. You can just like look at the photo, I mean, pictures. And also it allows some um, imaginations to, you know, there's a room for imagination other than, like unlike film or photo. No, I, I agree, yeah. So I think that in that way, like comic can make some certain subject a lot more personal for the people who are reading it. So that's why I think comic is a good medium for any any storytelling or information, you know, besides com uh, food. Um, sorry, like, <laughs> um, I guess I don't know. It's uh, 
I started doing food related comics, or it kind of percolated for me as a thing that I should um, approach, uh, and also kind of with this dual uh, thing of I need to document my parents' generation, my grandmother's generation's kind of stories, and a lot of what they pass down is through food. Um, so they're all getting older, and I think that uh, with our kind of generational differences being uh, you know, children of immigrants, and um, I think that there's a lot that would just be lost um, if I didn't kind of start putting in an effort to, oh, learn recipes from um, my parents or um, my uncles and my grandmother. Um, and for me, I guess I started realizing that, oh, a lot of, yeah, our family stories are either told at the dinner table or the stories were um, through us making food. So for me, it was also kind of a, oh, a preservation of family history thing and also a, a way for me to share, I guess, my um, cultural experiences um, being uh, Asian American to other people as well. Mm -hmm. But in that way, I'm also kind of protective about it because uh, growing up uh, where, you know, you bring in food from that your uh, mom made you or your uncles and my uncles and my grandmother made you, that experience in America is definitely kind of, you know, unfortunately tainted with this experience of like, ew, what's that? <laughs> um, so um, I'm also kind of really protective of it. Um, so getting to that level where I feel comfortable sharing my family stories and food really stories with strangers essentially is also an experience in itself and that's why it has a gravitas to me um, about it and I take it pretty seriously, even though a lot of the stories I include in my comics are kind of very humorous, so. I feel like that the, just the act of writing about food, um, I'm not the most adventurous of eater, at least I didn't grow up the most adventurous of eater. When I was in college, the, the biggest treat we could have was Hamburger Helper. Um, there, there was some that came with, like, you can make your own sour cream by putting water on this powder, and that was like, ooh, we're kings. Um, <laughs> So, like, just recently, I started getting into more, uh, more interesting food than just that, um, and I think that a lot of that comes from reading things like, like these comics here, where I can almost try it out for a little while first, where I can read about other people's experiences with the food instead of just looking at a, a recipe and being like, oh, okay, I guess I'll put these ingredients together and I don't know what it'll be. I get like a backstory and then I get to have more of a um, connection to it, um, even though that's not even though I haven't even eaten it yet, I have a little bit more of a connection to it that maybe I can appreciate it a little better. Um, yeah? Well, I think when I was first starting to make comics about food, I was mostly like, I was for the first time in my life being around a lot of people like in college and stuff who hadn't grown up cooking really and like were unfamiliar with even like how to chop up a vegetable like they just didn't know how to do that which is completely foreign to me and comics are a very good medium i think to make something like that very accessible um rather than having like an all text recipe that's kind of daunting sometimes even if it's actually a very simple thing um and so you know having goofy characters being enthusiastic about this dumb thing <laughs> can can make, I think, uh, get people over that hurdle, or at least that's my goal on a lot of things. Uh, I was also gonna say that I really like food comics in particular because you can take them into the kitchen with you and use them as a guide as you're cooking. And like comics in particular, as a visual medium, allow you to show step by step how you do a thing, as opposed to just a written recipe, which is usually just text, and I can see why that would be in some ways very isolating for someone who's new to cooking. Mm. And it's like a thing that I really love um, about your comic in particular, uh, which is like just full of uh, like instructional images on how to do things. Like yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to also ask you guys if you have like a favorite food-related anecdote, funny story, or something in that vein that you guys would like to share. Mm. That's tough. Um, that's actually that's pretty tough because I have so many, and that's actually kind of the content of my like upcoming webcomics. So spoilers. <laughs> but um, but I mean, one thing that's like uh, for me, like my, a lot of family 
food things come with a lot of mythology too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Autumn Moon Festival, which is a uh, holiday that's celebrated by um, Chinese um, people and I believe Koreans too, um, has like, and the kind of big food thing related to that is moon cakes. So that's actually next week, and I think. So, um, and I know that one story that my grandmother always told me about mooncakes is that um, some time ago, way back when, when some foreign uh, invaders had control of some Chinese town, uh, the peasants in that uh, village um, decided to pass a message about, oh, when the uprising was going to be through mooncakes. And so the foreign invaders didn't realize that. Um, Oh, that they, um, because this is the, like, oh, this is some peasant, you know, festival type thing, uh, we'll let them have their mooncakes. Uh, but then it turns out there was a note in the mooncakes that's like, on this time or whatever, we can get together and kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so things like that. Um, and, you know, there's also like um, the rice pyramids for a, um, I guess a, it's a Chinese festival in summer. Um, we know it more as the Dragon Boat Festival. The Dragon Boats are cool and all, but that's not actually the main reason why we celebrate that festival. Um, and we make these like rice pyramid uh, shaped dumplings wrapped by banana leaves. I actually have a painting here. It's in my dumpling scene. And the reason why like these are made is because um, back, like I'm really bad with historical dates. So, but back in some time, there was a patriot who warned the emperor, like, who was like, oh, so-and-so is gonna invade, you need to get serious about politics, stop, like, you know, just being a bad prince type thing, and, like, because the, uh, the emperor only cared about partying. And then the emperor tells, uh, tells this, um, he's, he's, a he's a poet. Um, back then, like, poets were also politicians and patriots. Um, so he tells this guy who's named Chuan, he's like, oh, Chuan, my enough, it's not gonna happen, nothing's gonna happen, here, have some, like, alcohol or something. And sure enough, they get invaded, it's all really horrible, um, and he, the Patriot is so um, kind of heartbroken over this that he commits suicide by jumping into the river. Um, but he was much beloved by the, um, the populace, so, um, like kind of the peasantry made these um, rice packets uh, wrapped in banana leaves to throw in the river. Um, and this is where the mythology actually kind of diverges a bit. It's either to feed the fish so that they wouldn't eat his body, or it's to feed his soul in the afterlife. And this is a tradition that is carried on kind of each day, or each year, sorry, not each day. Um, and I grew up knowing that my grandmother made these from scratch but because of the way that you wrap it, you have to kind of use your teeth to pull in the string. And now that she's older, she can't really do that anymore because um, she doesn't have like the teeth strength to um, do that. So but that's kind of, there's that connection between my family and this mythology. Is that was it? really interesting. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Did anyone else have any? Thing they wanted to share. Oh, man, my story's gonna sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> There's no patriots committing suicide no. or food, this or is, not food, but like. This is my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was asking, uh, I was asking my girlfriend, like, I have, I, what, what story could I tell? And there's two stories that she suggested, and one is that, um, one that my mother always tells whenever we're having like any sort of grilling, that when she was first like invited into the family after. Um, marrying my father, um, she was hanging out with her mom, and they were grilling, and there was a bowl of marinade sitting next to the grill, and uh, they were putting it on the chicken, and then a bird poops in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother looks at her mother, my grandmother, and her grandmother goes, eh. <laughs> and is like, we'll eat these two, they'll eat yeah. these, and then she just bites it. So um, my grandfather found out about that. He was so overcome with emotion that he committed suicide <laughs> by jumping into a, in a river. Um, and then the other one was when I first met uh, uh, my girlfriend, and she came and visited uh, my family. And uh, we went up to, they have a, a little cabin by a, a lake. And um, 
Like the like we just got she, she just got there and they're like oh well come on let's go get ice cream, and my girlfriend was like but it's like one in the afternoon you don't just get ice cream at one it's like oh no let's go get ice cream so we got ice cream and then we got lunch right after that and then we got <laughs> dinner like three hours later and then after that my mother was like you want to get some ice cream <laughs> and my girlfriend was just like we. Yes, I do. <laughs> so we got ice cream, and then that night, Jess, was, Jess being my girlfriend, was like, I was born into the wrong family. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most wonderful family that there ever could be. Aww. And her mother found out about that, and she was over, so overcome with grief. <laughs> <laughs> she jumped into a river. Uh, that was good. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you guys some specific questions. Uh, Robin actually said something about comics being like room for imagination and being kind of fantastical. And uh, Jesse, when you do food comics, you always draw yourself as a bunny. And I just wanted to, you know, to kind of talk about that and like how that plays into the kind of recipes you choose to illustrate in your comics. Um, I mean, I mostly draw myself as a bunny because I really like bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> But um, like you had pointed out in, in correspondence that I do pretty much only do vegetarian recipes and that's something that I didn't realize. Uh, like I just kind of, um, I think because I have a focus on making them accessible to a wide variety of people, meat is like not everybody wants to eat it or can eat it and also just like it's difficult <laughs> to prepare sometimes. Um, so it's easier to just chop up a carrot. <laughs> um, but um, I do purposely draw myself very cartoony and simple and approachable. Um, just I like to convey a lot of enthusiasm about the food and being able to like stretch expressions and like also kind of um, I think it puts a little bit of a bit of distance between myself and this image of myself because um, another thing that I uh, consciously try to talk about through the comics is just I think it's important to have a female character being really really enthusiastic about eating and enjoying food um, and that's something that like even though I think is very important and, um, and I am very enthusiastic about, like, still in real life, I am self-conscious about that a lot of times. So I think having the bunny distance helps. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then I also wanted to ask you, uh, do you ever cook things or grow things just so you can talk about it in a comic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I have. Most of the stuff that I've made comics about are like kind of staples mm -hmm. that I eat all the time. Um, I've definitely grown stuff just to like make it into something specific. Um, but it's like, here's a comic about making pesto. I make a lot of pesto. <laughs> <laughs> I still have pesto in my freezer right at this moment that I made like a year or two ago. <laughs> uh, when I picked her up, because we drove together, she had just finished pickling cucumbers <laughs> and it smelled it, like I've vinegar. i jars of cucumbers in my fridge right now. <laughs> I grew those cucumbers. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. So uh, Robin, you said that your banchan is coming out in Jul next July, is yes. that what you said? All right, um, well, it's a Tumblr, right? Where you're yes. posting all the, the comics? And I was actually gonna ask you about that because uh, you obviously had limited yourself to two pages per recipe. Mm -hmm. And initially I was wondering, uh, like, I'm like, well, you can, you're can you online, like you can make it as long as you want. Like right. you could put as much information in a Tumblr format as you would choose. So uh, that answers that question. Mm -hmm. um, but I did wanna ask, like, how does limiting yourself to the two pages per recipe, like how does that impact like what you choose to include versus what you choose to leave out? Mm -hmm. And um, like sometimes you'll also put these nice like footer notes at the end of the comic. Are those gonna make it into the printed book at all or is that just for Tumblr? Um, those footers are just gonna be at the Tumblr. So maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I should just put photos and footnotes on the Tumblr so it's still useful even after my book comes out. Because uh, 
there's no room for like a footer on an yeah. actual book, you know? So the books are just gonna be the recipes plus some antidote like uh, comics in the beginning of the chapters and you know, like uh, introduction comics and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is a challenge for me to choose what to put in it or not. It's that two page space is such a valuable real estate, you know? So some of them has to be for drawing, some of them has to be for text, and a lot of times I have to really think about somebody who's looking at this food for the first time. Yeah. Like, a lot of these things, I don't even need to explain it, in my opinion, because like, I know this food, I grew up with it, but then somebody who's never seen, you know, like some of these ingredients, like there are a few condiments and stuff that you definitely need to cook. Um, what you definitely need when you're cooking Korean food. And I think at this time, at this era, like Korean food is really popular. So I think a lot of people who are into food are familiar with it, but I just have to assume that nobody knows anything about Korean food. So uh, when it's like super important and it's gonna appear in everything I do, every recipe, then I have to explain it. But if it's just like a small thing that I think it's like, let's say like a anchovy, dried anchovy, mm -hmm. like a lot of people might think it's really gross and weird. It's a dead fish that you're gonna eat. <laughs> but it's part I only of eat live fish. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not flapping around on my. I mean, like dead and dried, and like it's it. been drying in the air for like a year, fish, you know. But it's a it's a big part of. Korean cuisine, mm -hmm. you know, when you're making soups, that's going to be part of that soup stock recipe most of the time. So things like that, I do take a time to explain. Well, when it's like garlic or spicy pepper, it's like, of course, it's spicy. So you put it in it. So I don't really take time to mm -hmm. explain that, you know. Well, I noticed that one of the very first ones you had posted was just a list of like pantry essentials, yeah, and yeah. I thought that was really helpful. Good. Um, I thought that was really smart. And another thing I really appreciated was that you included photos of a lot of things oh, yeah. uh, because, like, why not? Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's like I mean, it's your comic. You can do you can do that. I just thought that was really cool. Uh, I'm not super familiar with Korean food, but I'm really excited to like delve into it with the book when it comes out. <laughs> uh, you guys should all check that out. Is it just bonchan.tumblr.com? Uh, yeah, bonchancomic.tumblr.com. Oh, there we go. So these are at my table. This is not for sale because it's coming out next July, but this one you can buy it. Okay. <laughs> um, Jade. Uh, I wanted you to talk a little more about, well, for, uh, something that I thought was really interesting about your hot pot recipe and comfort food zine okay. was that you didn't really include like measurements or anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, I understand why. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about like, cause you explained like, like a history with your family. Yeah. And like, I know that like lots of different, like uh, Chinese families will mm -hmm. have different variations of hot pot. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of like hear like, is that like really common with every recipe in your family? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's no measurements. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, like particularly with dumpling making too, because there's a lot of hot pot at the very least, it's like, oh, you adjust it to your taste because it's ultimately a big pot of soup in the middle. And then people um, take ingredients out of the pot and uh, bring it to their bowl. Um, so however much you want the sauce, when, uh, that's per your personal taste or each individual person's taste at the table. But for things like dumplings, where, yeah, there's a lot of steps to it, and there's definitely a balance that you have to strike. Otherwise, let's say your dough, if you put in too much water or, um, or something, it gets, if it's too soft, it's ha really hard to fold. Uh, the stuffing in. and then the stuffing balance is if you put like vegetables in too early or salt in too early it releases too much water and so it becomes really difficult so you think that like there is uh, a measurements that are passed down but I asked my uncle who's the dumpling master in my family whom I learned most things from and my mom and my grandmother and they're like oh I just go by my feeling and I'm just like, okay, so roughly water to flour ratio is like, oh, you just, you know, you feel it. <laughs> like, yeah. Or like, like, you know, until, handful. I'm like, so until when, like, you know, what indicators do I have to, to know that it's like, right? And they're like, well, you know, when it's right. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, and I, I labored over this and kind of like, you know, drawing my comics. I'm like, well, how am I going to translate this in a way that, 
um, people will be able to understand. So I had to experiment a lot myself to like and take notes. And then I also just kind of wrote that into my comments. Um, you know, the experience of me asking my uncle, and he's like, oh, just, you know, touch it. And, um, so that's a story in and of itself. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, like, you know, he, he's been making dumplings for, like, what, like, I don't know, like 40 years now mm -hmm. and everything. So um, for him, you know, he doesn't necessarily need measurements. And after a while, I think that uh, he ultimately, um, I think with cooking in general, um, you know, you use recipes, but you're, for some recipes that you want to kind of be uh, really good at just because, um, you know, it's something that you like to eat a lot, your ultimate goal should be like reaching no recipes, if that makes sense, yeah. right? That's some, like, that's like some weird <laughs> Zen bullshit way of like looking at it, but it's kind of true. So um, a lot of the times in if I don't necessarily do like strict recipes, like kind of, oh, here's the ingredients list and how much of each, but um, I kind of give these explanations of like um, what balance you yeah. might want to try to strike or what texture you're looking out for. So for like dumpling dough, it's you need to knead it until it's completely smooth and your hand uh, does not stick to it. And one thing that I thought was like kind of odd is um, if you're making dumplings to boil, you have to mix it with cold water. If you make dumplings to steam, you have to mix it with hot water. And there's a difference. So, um, because apparently it's like if, because uh, steamed dumplings, like, you know, ultimately it doesn't cook as thoroughly. So your dough, you want it to be already kind of half cooked. And that's what gives off the translucentness of steamed type dumplings. So when you're mixing it, it has to be with hot water. I would have never thought there would be a difference. Yeah. That's so That's cool. Like secret revealed. <laughs> um, I can really identify with you on the measurements thing. My great grandmother uh, made the best buttermilk biscuits in the whole world. Um, and when my mom was trying to like learn the recipe before she passed away, she's like, you know, you just like a handful yeah. of this. Especially with baking, it's kind of like, yeah, but our hands are different sizes. <laughs> yeah. um, and then things like, oh, a Vienna sausage can of this thing, like as a measurement. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think when you get, when you just know how to do it by heart, it's just, you don't even have to measure it anymore, for sure. Um, okay, well, uh, I wanted to talk to you guys a bit about, uh, um, like... Chef, I have a question, if it's okay? Yeah. I have a question for you. Okay. I don't know if this is, like, an uh, American thing or anything like that, but does your, is your family okay with recipes being shared and oh, how yeah. to cook things? Um, they're fine. I think that, like, because they know I'm doing this, and I definitely ask them, and I don't think that they necessarily hold any, like, oh, this is a secret family mm -hmm. type thing. I think that... They also kind of just assume that no one cares, and they're like, <laughs> so like, so I'm of the opinion that's like, oh, well, this is something that I want to, you know, draw and share with people. When I ask them about it, their first question is like, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, because like, it's something that like, you know, so why do you want to know about this <laughs> or something? It's like, shouldn't you be? I don't know. Shouldn't you be like I don't know, painting portraits of people's dogs mm -hmm. and getting commissioned? <laughs> to, like, I'm like, well. I don't know. So I mean, so they're kind of blasé about it. It's not to say that they don't care about yeah. their recipes. I think that um, for them, there's it's just this like kind of thing for them. Yeah, yeah, and it's also. I mean, I also come from a family where like um, several of my um, older family members have owned restaurants and stuff before. But and the thing with kind of like Chinese restaurants and having kind of that there's a stigma to it. Um, and but it's something that they also kind of have been impacted by. So they are of the opinion that like um, if we open a Chinese restaurant in America, Americans are looking for a specific type of right. Chinese mm -hmm. food, like General Tso's chicken. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not interested in like our family recipes. So they're not particularly secretive about it. They just kind of assume that unless people like really like ask them or look for it. Um, that they're just, they just assume that everyone's like, oh, uh, where's my general sales right. type thing. And, you know, and the flip side of that too is that I definitely, growing up and even in college, uh, have been approached by people and asked by people, it's like, so how do you eat that every day? I'm like, I don't. <laughs> like, or something. It's like, you know, oh, why is it all like weirdly colored chicken? What's tofu made out of? Soy. Um, so, 
Yeah, or like, you know, oh, hey, do you want to like come over? Like, we're going to saute some stuff. Okay, sure. Why are you putting so much soy sauce in that? Stop. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's definitely these like, there's a general idea of what Chinese food is that I think my um, family kind of has just accepted that, oh, that's what people are expecting. And then there's like what we eat at home, mm -hmm. which is oftentimes not like that at all. So I feel like if I was to do comics showing the mysteries and histories of my family's cooking, like my mom would get like final cut and she would be like, the, NS <laughs> the NSA came through and was like, you're not telling them about. I actually, <laughs> those, yeah. That, what I put in that chicken salad, there's no way. <laughs> my uh, great aunt Lucille had a peanut butter cake recipe that she took to the grave, literally. <laughs> uh, but they found it in her kitchen and then passed it out to family. But we're like, you cannot, Lauren, <laughs> you cannot share this with anyone. Um, but the biscuit recipe, I actually have a mini of, and uh, I'm actually going to be doing like a macaroni and cheese zine um, at some point with our family macaroni and cheese recipes, uh, and they're just going to have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, because like, yeah, I, I'm of the opinion, like, I, I understand like secret family recipes and, and like wanting to, like to keep it special if it's yours and you developed it, but uh, at the same time, like, I... What is so great about making food comics is that I get to share food with someone kind of retroactively or like indirectly. Like I don't have to cook it for them, but I'm giving them the means to cook it themselves. And like this is my favorite macaroni and cheese recipe. And I want you guys to experience it because it's the best one. Um, <laughs> but um, oh, yeah, that was a good question. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to talk to you guys about color in food comics because very often they are not in color. And actually, Eric, your book is now in color, right? Yes, ma'am. And I wanted to ask you, like, what was the process of, like, drawing it originally in black and white and then retroactively adding color? And do you feel like that has made a big difference in how the food's portrayed in the comic? Um, I am deathly afraid of color. Um, <laughs> I ne this is the first book I've ever colored, and I freaked out very, very badly um, while funny. I was doing it. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I was coloring it uh, last year, and I was just having daydreams of hiring a colorist. Like <laughs> I was like zoning out. I was like, "Oh, someone else will do this next year." Um, but I can't look at the original comics anymore because the color just just makes it so much better, especially with the food. Um, I read uh, a lot of while I was doing research for this book. I read a lot of um, like Japanese cooking comics. There's one called Bambino, which is my favorite. I recommend it. Um, if you start reading it and you're like, this is really silly, just keep reading it because yes, it's very silly, but it's great. But that's all in black and white. Mm -hmm. And the you know the the stuff that that artist does with with tones and and shading and stuff, but still it's black and white. So they'll put something on the table and it's like this is a risotto with blah blah blah. And you're like, oh well, that looks good. But I bet <laughs> you if that was in color, it'd be great. Yeah. And um, so I think that what I was originally going to do was I was going to just color the food in the original comic. I was going to teach myself how to watercolor. So that's the other great thing. I was going to first color my first book, and I was going to teach myself a new way of coloring. <laughs> so that crashed and burned hard. Um, but I was just going to do the food um, because I just felt like um, that needed to be in color. Um, especially because, and this I don't know if this is a universal thing with anybody here, but I never really thought about food as far as illustration was concerned until I saw um, Spirited Away by uh, Miyazaki. Because <laughs> uh, that's the most beautiful food in no, the world. Um, so well, like when I saw the, the stuff that, that comes out of that, it was like this food has to be in color and it has to look delicious and it has to be amazing. Um, which is actually a, a struggle I'm having in the second book because there's uh, a series of oysters that he opens up. And I don't know if you've ever had an oyster before. They are in no way pretty on the inside. Uh, it's like a head cold inside a rock. And um, so I had to come up with a way, especially because this is a kid's book, I had to come up with a way to make a uh, head cold look really delicious. Um, and I hope I did it right. Um, but yeah, as far as the coloring is concerned, it's, 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 it's black and white. Looking mm -hmm. at it from the black and white to the color, there's, I, I can't believe that I did it not in color, um, for me at least. I, I feel like uh, most people start comics off in black and white, and like I feel like I, it's a thing I've struggled with because like foodzine and comfort foodzine were both in black and white, and uh, I 
would love to do a book in color one day because it, for, like for me personally, like seeing food, one of the most appealing things is like seeing how it's browned on, in the oven mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. how crisp and like brightly colored vegetables are. And like, it just takes a really skilled artist to depict that in black and white. And I, if anything, that's like an additional challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was just like, did, does anyone else have any like thoughts on that? I know Jesse, you, you love working in black and white. Yeah. And I was just wondering how you like, feel. Um, I think specifically with like my recipe comics, I am terrible at making the food look good. This is something that I'm still trying to figure out. Um, so bad at it there. <laughs> um, with uh, with the food in which light, I think I'm being a little more successful with it. Um, mainly because uh, I decided that since it's a fantasy world, all the food is fantasy world stuff too. So like. If it's a vegetable, it's a made-up vegetable. If it's a meat, it's a made-up meat. So you don't know what they're actually supposed to look like, so I can just make them look like whatever, and it still looks pretty good. Um, also, I draw steam on, like, everything. Steam makes <laughs> stuff look great. <laughs> because it's like, oh, it's hot. Must be good. <laughs> um, actually, with made-up fruits and vegetables, do you make up fruits and vegetables for rutabaga? Yes. And I was wondering, uh, do you... Like, do you have just like a huge arsenal of fruits and vegetables and meats and dishes that you've made that you pull from when you're trying to come up with a story? Or do you make up them on the fly as you're working the plot out? Um, it, it depends on the story. Um, but uh, I was going to say the, the benefit that we have is that I could have like polka dot meat if I wanted to. And I don't know how often <laughs> you guys would pull out some polka dot meat. But um, Sometimes it starts with a, a story, and sometimes it starts with a recipe. Like um, in the uh, the last story in this book, it's he teams up with some Vikings, and they force him. He cooks a meal for them, and then he, they force him to sacrifice the uh, best part of the meat, which is horrible for him because that's what he wants to eat. And um, that comes from actually that comes from my mother, who at any time she was carving a turkey, she'd pull out the oysters, which are the bits in the bottom. Um, their meat, not uh, testicles. And uh, <laughs> she'd be like, she'd cook and she'd be like, this is for the chef. The oyster is the best part. And there's always two of them, so she'd give me one. So uh, I was like, oh, best part. And then I was thinking about the, um, the act of uh, sacrificing to the gods uh, a, a part of the food. So that came from just the, the very idea of just throwing away a part of the food, especially the best part. Uh, and then the recipes just didn't necessarily matter what he was cooking in that instance, um, except for the story-wise. But um, there's a story in the uh, in here about a, a, a squash. It's a haunted squash, and it's one of those squash that you've probably seen. I assume it's a squash that has. It looks like it has a crown on. It's like got little spikes coming at the top. Oh, turban and squash. I, what is it? Turban squash. Turban squash. Yes. I saw that in the in the store, and I was like, "That's a crown." <laughs> that's the haunted king's head. Clearly, that's what that is. Yeah. So I uh, I wrote a story around that, um, and it mostly comes from. Like, a lot of my stories just come from watching lots and lots of documentaries and um, food documentaries, which is really specifically about street food because it's the most delicious thing in the world. And uh, lots of America's Test Kitchen, and, uh, which yeah, is my America's favorite Test show Kitchen. in the world. Do uh, they have a podcast? I don't know, but I know that Lucy Nicely got on America's Test yeah, Kitchen. Yeah, they, they have a podcast. You should, you should check and it I'm out. I'm super jealous. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, it's, not the, uh, it's not the best. Does the recipe or the story come first? Depends. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's completely valid and good and great, you guys. Uh, we're actually getting a little low on time. Uh, I wanted to ask if you guys have any favorite restaurants in the area that you can recommend everyone go to for lunch, because I'm sure we're all, like, super duper hungry. <laughs> uh, well, I recently moved here, actually, so sorry, I don't really have any recommendations <laughs> around this neighborhood. But I can recommend some Korean food in my neighborhood, which is near Annandale in Virginia. You can still get there by um, public transportation. You can oh. take the orange line to get done rolling and take a bus. <laughs> <laughs> but there is this restaurant called Yechon that I go to like every week, basically. It's my go-to Korean barbecue. And like they're open 24 hours, and their service is like always good like I remember going there at like four in the morning when I was in high school after a hard night of clubbing <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like it's awesome like they're super nice like 
you know, the people who've been working there for, has been there for like 25 years, you know, so that's, that's the sign of like really good quality restaurant, you know, people stick around. Um, and then there is uh, this sushi restaurant called Yoshi in Vienna. And I, I love sushi. Like sushi is probably my second favorite food. What's the, the first world. one? McDonald's. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, my very favorite food is kimchi because it's so versatile. I can eat it with anything. But um, so I was kind of sad to leave New York. I lived there for 10 years and there's so many good food everywhere. And I was very glad to find this restaurant in Vienna because their sushi is awesome. So try it. Um, I grew up down the street, actually. <laughs> like, um, but uh, I found Gaithersburg, Rockville area. So I know that you guys got a, like a food map um, with the program, and that's great. Uh, but the secret is that on this side of the pike is eh, you want to go north. And so if you're able to like kind of drive a little bit, down there, it's a lot more kind of um, like mom and pop kind of hole in the wall places, but um, they're good. And for dumplings, actually, it's a little bit far north, but uh, a place called China Bistro is actually a really dumb name because <laughs> the Chinese name says Mama's Dumplings, which I don't know why they didn't just say Mama's Dumplings. <laughs> but um, China Bistro, it's kind of like uh, the outside is just this like reflective glass so you can't really see inside. It's next to the, China, uh, the giant. Um, so they actually have really good dumplings, and I have really like high standards for them. So um, where I'm going tonight <coughs> is a Sichuanese West restaurant called Sichuan Jin River. Um, and right nearby, is, uh, there's a new bubble tea place that opened up called Kung Fu Tea. But, so I haven't had uh, this bubble tea yet. But uh, for another place with good bubble tea that's closer by is Bubble Tea Cafe. Like you can actually taste the tea in the bottom <laughs> So, yeah, those are my recommendations. Um, I don't remember where it is, uh, but it's very easy to Google it. It's uh, it's in within walking distance, but it's a place called Sheba. Um, it's Ethiopian food, and if you've never had that, uh, eat it because it is very very <laughs> good. Um, you basically eat the plate, so that's wonderful. Um, they're very small, so I don't know if they do reservations, but that's my only my only suggestion is if you're going to go, try to get a reservation because we waited for a very long time to eat there. I think I'm not going to be very helpful. I haven't actually eaten anything but travel snacks since I got here. <laughs> and I remember one place that I went with a friend last year, but I can't remember where it was or what it was called. But it was good. So. <laughs> <laughs> what did you eat? Who was the friend? I guess we'll, get, we'll find the friend. And find Ed. <laughs> okay, we'll what did you eat there? Um, it was... So here, I know, I know. I had like a plantain quesadilla. That sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. Does it, it look kind of like a nightclub on the inside, like cool lights and stuff? I think. Paladar. Maybe. Yeah, Maybe. It's, a, it's a Latin bistro. <laughs> the Ropa Viejo is really good. All right. Um, you guys have heard of uh, Chili's? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Not really. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, coming to the panel, and I, I hope yeah. everyone enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we are gonna, bye. <laughs> <laughs>